Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. I was reading an article online this past week, and it posed a very interesting question. I want to pose this question to you also. So it said and asked, do you and or your congregation view COVID-19 as an interruption or a disruption to church life? Is COVID-19 an interruption or a disruption to church life? So to get started with that, of course, I went to look for the dictionary. And this is what it says from the Cambridge Dictionary for an interruption. An interruption is an occasion when someone or something stops something else from happening for a short period of time. Now I added on to that, and then it resumes, usually where it left off, with little or no change. So think of a commercial. A commercial is an interruption in a TV program, and certainly you hope when that interruption is over that you're coming back to the same TV program. If not, you're gonna lose the plot that's happening, right? And so that's what an interruption is. An interruption just sort of disrupts it for the moment, but it comes back into its usual state. A disruption is the action of preventing something, especially a system, process, or event from continuing as usual or as expected. Or it's the action of completely changing the traditional way that an industry or market operates by using new methods or technology. The action of completely changing the traditional way that an industry or market operates by using new methods or technology. So now if I ask you, which do you wish that COVID-19 was? Do you wish it to be an interruption or a disruption? And many of us would say, we just want it to be an interruption because we want everything to return to normal, don't we? Whatever normal is, exactly. Whatever we call normal, that's what we want the church to return to. If we are honest with ourselves and truly answer that question in the right way. So in looking at answering that question, I turned to the Reformation and I asked myself this, was the Reformation an interruption or a disruption to church life? As I pondered the Reformation, these things came out. I believe that it was both. I believe that there were parts of the church and church life that returned to whatever kind of normal we call normal, right? I do think that throughout the Reformation and even after post-Reformation, that liturgy in the church was still the same, that the, the sacraments didn't change, that it, would, it returned to some sense of normalcy after that, that, uh, that, the, um, that communion and baptism certainly came back and were the same kinds of things. I believe too that um, it was a disruption to church life. It was a disruption to church life, probably more than it was an interruption, because we know what happened with the Reformation. I mean, let's be real. That's why we have Protestants. That's why we have the Lutheran Church, because the church was disrupted. And how did that come about? What happened? The first thing I think that happened was this, that scripture became accessible to all. Prior to that, the church, the church deemed that people were not educated enough to be trusted with the word of God. Well, the, the Protestants, the, the uh, excuse me, the reformers said that's not true, that people are smart enough, that in conversation, they can learn what scripture is and they can know what. So what happened was scripture came into the home of the people. It moved out of the four walls of a building 
and move into their homes. Luther helped with that because Luther translated the Bible into German, the language of his people. At that time, during the Reformation, the Bible was also translated into English. The Bible was being translated into the languages of the people, and Luther even went so far as to write, and uh, any of us who've been through Lutheran catechism, uh, those of us who are older will cringe at the thought of the small catechism and the large catechism and all of the confessions that we had to learn, right? But those things all brought the word of God into the homes of the people, out of four walls and where it needed to be, where people needed it most. The other thing that I think that disrupted the Reformation was that worship came out of the church, that people were not just worshiping. I mean, let's be real. The people who left the Catholic church didn't automatically build their own churches, right? For many of them, they met in houses for a while. They met wherever they could meet. It wasn't necessarily that they went right out and built their own churches. So worship left the building. Worship became something that was not necessarily tied to four walls, but became something that was more about God and the God who created us. It was more about Jesus Christ who died for our sins. It was more about the Holy Spirit moving people to be what they didn't even know that they could be. So in a disruption, worship left the building. And I think a third disruption in the Reformation was technology. Because why was the Reformation so successful? The printing press. Absolutely. And because of the printing press, and because people were willing to use that technology, the word of the Reformation spread widely and became popular among the people. So was the Reformation an interruption or a disruption? Well, like I said, I believe it was both. And I believe that the interruption returned some things to a normal state. Again, whatever normal is. But I do believe that the Reformation disrupted church life. That the Reformation improved church life from what it was. Because let's be real, the church was a little bit corrupt at that time, which is why Luther was really fighting against it. Or now maybe not fighting against it, but wanting conversation. Wanting to see what are we doing that's not so good in the church, as church people. And so that disruption changed a lot of things at the Reformation. And for us, thankfully, it did. Because we can gather here today, and come on, let's be real. We are singing our anthem today, right? A mighty fortress is our God. As Lutherans, we consider that to be our hymn. And we stand by that hymn. So the Reformation was a disruption, an interruption as well. So I return to our, the original question. Is COVID-19 an interruption or a disruption to the church? An interruption, remember, is that it just stops things for a while and then everything returns to normal. A disruption, let me read that to you again, a disruption is, um, uh, right here, the action of preventing something, especially a system, process, or event, for, from continuing as usual or as expected. Or it is the action of completely changing the traditional way that an industry or market operates by using new me methods or technology. Just as the Reformation, I believe that COVID-19 is both. It is both. It is an interruption and it is also a disruption. It is an interruption in that, look at where we are on Sunday morning. It is an interruption in that we're Lutherans. We are certainly going to keep our liturgy because as Lutherans, we love liturgy. Now, sometimes people say that 
that I'm gonna I'm just gonna step into this that that uh, we have service worship services that don't have liturgy. Well, you know what? That's not correct. Liturgy is the work of the people. And so anytime you have people involved in worship, that is liturgy. It's not something that comes straight out of the ELW. It's not something that comes out of any tradition that we have, but liturgy is the work of the people. So anytime when we are gathered and the people are working in worship together, that, my friends, is liturgy. And that is something that we will not give up. We, when we return, I think that an interruption is to uh, the sacraments a little bit, to baptism, because we haven't brought public baptisms back uh, in the building yet. So I believe those are interruptions. But I also believe that COVID-19 is a disruption to the church. I believe that COVID-19 is a, a disruption to the church because just as in the Reformation, it's time to take the word of God out of the building. It's time that we take the word of God into places where we didn't even know God was calling us to. It's time to be present to people where they are, not expecting them to come and be where we are. Now, I'm going to talk about technology in a little bit, but technology is an example of taking that word out into the world. Here, here's the truth. <laughs> I don't speak technology. Technology is a language I have no idea what it means. I don't speak technology. But you know what? I know people that do. See, that's where disruption comes in, is that I have to learn to trust that people who speak a different language are willing to move the gospel forward and not change them so that they speak my language. I remember several years ago, one of the uh, uh, youth gatherings that we had for the ELCA, every night they would put a new language up on the screen. You know what one of the nights was? One of the nights was text messaging. Another language I don't speak at all, right? But I also have to learn to trust that it is a language that some people speak. Now, here I, I will be honest with you, in, in my um, mature wisdom, I'll put it that way, in my mature wisdom, I don't necessarily have to speak the language, but I've got to find that interpreter. I've got to find that person who will help me listen to the people who speak the language. I believe that COVID-19 is a disruption in that worship can happen in more places than just in these four walls. There's a movement now out called uh, Dinner Church, where church happens around a meal. Now, it doesn't happen before the meal, and it doesn't happen after the meal. It happens during the meal. It is enveloped in the meal. And, and this is precisely Jesus' theology of community and eating together. If you read, especially Luke, you are going to find that Jesus eats a lot. And he eats with other people. And in the midst of that, he's teaching them and worshiping with them, and they are learning. I think we as church have to understand that worship can happen in different ways. Pub theology is another thing that happens. And I know some of you cringe when you hear pub. Notice I didn't say bar theology because that would even make you know, people cringe even more. But pub theology, and, and you know, I respect pub theology because who went to bars? Luther. Luther took the word of God into bars. Luther spoke with people in those bars. And, and this is a, something that you may not know. Some of Luther's hymns that he wrote are actually tunes. Bar, they're bar tunes. They're bar tunes. He just switched the words and made it so that it was uh, a faithful hymn. So I think that we have to take the church out. I think that small groups are a way... 
you know, some of you are already meeting in small groups. You have some faithful small group. We have some really faithful small groups going on in this church, and that is worship. I think that there are many ways that we can take worship out into the church. Where I believe that the church has an antiquated system is that the only people we count as worshipers are the ones who enter the rooms where we say this is where worship happens. That's an old system. There are people worshiping all over the place. I'll tell you this, and, and, and some of you don't even realize it, but our Wednesday morning Bible study is worship. Women's Bible study is worship. Uh, so, so saints is worship. We have people worshiping in this building every single day. Do you know that AA is worship? Did you know that? Did you realize that? That a group of outsiders who come in to use our building are worshiping? I think it's time for the church, and I'm not talking just about All Saints, but the broader church, to take a look at how do we count people. Is it necessary to count them physically, or is it good to just see faith growth? I believe that's where we are, and that numbers don't matter. Because scripture says, where what? Two or three are gathered, there I am in the midst of them. I do think that technology is our friend. And I do say that, you know, tongue in cheek, because technology is a friend of, you know, like uh, 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 Alex, it, certainly, wave Alex. Yes, technology is your friend, isn't it, Alex? Yes, and I like Alex. <laughs> yes. At the beginning of the pandemic, we were on the very verge of live streaming. Seriously, we were ahead of the game, but a week into it, COVID happened. A week into it, we didn't even have the cameras. We didn't have anything yet. And so we had to really push to get into that area. And thankfully, there were people who were willing to learn how to use technology. We used technology to live stream so that people who were not here in church, and that was all of us for a time, that when we were not here in church, we were able to hear the word of God. And we were able to be in community. We were in community. I'll tell you this right now. The people who are live streaming with us right now, they're in our community. We say, well, they're not here. Once again, it's an old system. They're in our community. Abby was willing to take on the challenge and learn all kinds of new things about technology. I will say this for the choir, each and every one of you, wow. And, and for Lauren, putting on the virtual choirs that you did, you had to learn new things, right? And you could have said, we're not gonna learn new things. We want this to be an interruption and we want everything to return to normal. You, my friends, were disrupted in your church life and you learned new things. And when we do those new things, people can be included. Do you know that when we do women's Bible study, we have people from Tennessee join us. We have people from uh, Newark, Ohio join us. We have people from all over the world that join us for our Bible study. Men's Bible study too has it. Technology is our friend. It's just that we have to learn how to use it and use it in the right way that it brings the word of God to people where they are. It's hard, and it's going to be hard for those of us who want everything to return to normal. I've heard that a lot. I can't wait till COVID is over and everything returns to normal. Well, I'll tell you this. I can't wait till COVID is over and the church is reformed. I can't wait because there are new things that are going to come out of this. This, my friends, is a time of reformation in the church. And we have got to learn to find those new ways that the word of God can go out to everyone. We have got to find people who are interpreters for us of the languages that young people are speaking. We have got to learn from 
the Reformation, that change can be good, that renewal and reformation can move the church forward into a new and improved way. May we, as the new reformers, trust God, trust God in the midst of this, and may we find a way to move the church forward so that more people are reached. Amen.